there were the truckers before there was the great festival of freedom in Ottawa, before the Coots blockade and the Windsor Ambassador Bridge, there was one man who stood up and rallied not just his country, but indeed the world. You remember the clip and his telltale accent. Get out! Get out! He said, remember this clip? Please get out. Get out of this property. Immediately get out. Get out of this property immediately. Out. I don't want to hear anything. Out of this property immediately. I don't want to hear a word. Out. Out. Out of this property immediately until you come back with a warrant. Out. 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 Out of this property. Immediately out. Immediately go out and don't come back. I don't want to talk to you. Not a word. Out of this pro out of this property immediately. Out. I don't care what you have to say. Out. Out. Out of this property, you Nazis. Out. Out. Gestapo is not allowed here. Immediately, Gestapo is not allowed. Out. Do you understand English? Get out of this property. Go. So go. Go. And don't come back without the warrant. Well, that man is Arthur Pavlovsky. And indeed, he was one of the first victims of lockdown bullying by our police. In fact, he was client number one of the Fight the Fines project. It was very early days, just weeks into the lockdown, you know what they said, two weeks to flatten the curve. And Arthur Pavlovsky was doing what Arthur does. He was in the streets. It was snowing, and he was feeding the homeless and the hungry, the lowest of the low, though so low they're sometimes not even allowed, into homeless shelters. He was out there feeding them, and police came up to him, physically pushed him around, and gave him a massive fine for, get this, having an illegal gathering. This is a video that so enraged me, I called up Pastor Arthur and said, we've got to fight back, and he became the first client. Take a look and remember what it was like early in 2020. This is not a event. This is not your picnic in a neighborhood for the fun of it. We are providing necessities of life to those that you and your bosses refuse to provide. You've got all kinds of events happening right now. I'm trying to and yet, the Calgary's finest are not bothering them. No this is the hypocrisy of this city. This is the hypocrisy of <laughs> our wonderful, fearless leaders. Where is Nahed named she? The mayor of this city. Can you guys do that? He's allowed to get back from here a little bit. Honey, honey, whoa, 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 whoa. On your feet. Stand back. Okay? Or what? Stand You're back. gonna f***ing threaten me? Stand and Abuse me? Hey, guys, do not do, not do that. Feet, Tell him not to touch me. Six feet away for everybody. Back up now. That's for everybody. Well, now it's almost the end of 2022, and yet Arthur Pavlovsky is not yet done with the law, although he has won every single case he has had, thanks to the donations to the Democracy Fund and the outstanding legal team led by Sarah Miller in Calgary. Well, he is not done yet. In fact, in February, Pastor Arthur faces charges being the first person prosecuted under the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, a law designed to stop eco-terrorism against pipelines. <laughs> They're using it against him for peaceful commentary. But the reason we're having today's special show with Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky is because on Friday, Pastor Arthur had a tremendous victory that sort of slipped under the radar, obviously, of the mainstream media, they don't care, but it was incredibly interesting and important. I'll tell you about it from what I heard from the lawyer, but let's bring in the man himself, Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky. Great to see you again. I'm delighted that you're at home. You spent almost 50 days in prison in the past year or two because of police bullying, but you had a day in court on Friday. It was supposed to be one of several days of trial in a row. But in the very first moments of the of the court, something unusual happened. What was it like? Were you there in the courtroom itself, Pastor Arthur? 
Yes, I was. This was our sixth day, believe it or not. And by the way, I spent 50 days the last time in jail uh, before they kept us, uh, me and my brother David, for a few days uh, at a time. So um, I have um, been privileged, put it this way, uh, to see a number of jails and, of course, the Riemann Center as well, solitary confinement, metal cages. I remember when they kidnapped me from Calgary, took me hundreds of miles away to Edmonton, placed me in max pot for the most dangerous offenders. And of course, after in a psych ward without the evaluation of the doctor's knowledge, even of the AHS. So yeah, the ordeal was crazy, but let's talk about what happened this Friday. And here is the frustration that I have, because today's politicians are talking about the courts, that the Crown prosecutors are overwhelmed and there's not enough of them and the criminals are going out free. They're getting away with the murder, literally. Um, and why? Uh, because, of course, um, there is not enough Crown prosecutors, uh, because they are not interested really in fighting the real criminals. They're after pastors they're yeah. after people that actually save lives right. they're after right. people that dare to oppose today's tyranny and that's exactly what happened to me and uh, we spent two days actually sarah spent two days in february when i was still in solitary confinement then three days we had the trial the moment we stepped in, Sarah agreed on the statements of facts. We agreed, yes, in fact, Your Honor, I did feed those people. The videos presented are from my own live feed, from Facebook, from YouTube. There's no dispute that I was there. I fed those people. Now let's move and look into the merits of the case. Okay, but of course, the crime... Pause for a second, Arthur. I just want to make sure this is easy for our viewers to follow. And you've been referring to a bunch of different interactions with the law, and all of them are heartbreaking and infuriating. And, and we can touch on a number of them, but I just want to let people know the, the sort of the breaking news. So, so I just want to pull it back to Friday. So on Friday, it was going to be one day of several days of a trial under a public health order issued uh, by the province of Alberta claiming that you had a private gathering when clearly it was not a private gathering, it was in public. They were, it, you cannot criminalize a public gathering in Canada, even though politicians might try to. They were prosecuting you, and I understand that they were seeking up to $100,000 in fines. So I just want to set the table. So the prosecutor's coming to get you. You've got Sarah Miller of the Democracy Fund. This is you know, what, your 16th hearing since the pandemic, they're clearly targeting you. The prosecutor sends over a massive briefing to your lawyer, Sarah Miller, the night before. You walk into court, you're ready for a battle. Sarah Miller, our hero, our champion, who's done such a great job fighting for you, is ready to fight. And then there was a surprise. Tell us about the surprise, because that's the breaking news that I think our viewers will scratch their head about. You were ready for a trial. What happened? Yes, the Crown Prosecutor walked in, would not even bow before the courts, would not even acknowledge us, not even say good morning, nothing. And when the judge showed up, she said, we are staying the charges. We're not going to proceed. I mean, wow. Um, after all those months, after two years of this craziness hanging over my head. As you remember, the Crown Prosecutor Johnston used that ticket, that trial against me to keep me in prison. He says to another judge during the bail hearing, Your Honor, this guy has multiple charges. He is not going to obey your orders. He is a lawbreaker. He's a troublemaker. He's a danger to society. He cost the Canadian economy over $400 million worth of damages. And he is inciting people to commit acts of violence and so on. And yet this Crown prosecutor during this proceeding just last Friday walks in and, okay, whatever, we're not proceeding. We're staying the charges. The but frustration. That's, yeah. Now, what was the e explanation? Because I spoke to your lawyer, Sarah Miller, and she told me that literally the, on the eve of trial, that this same prosecutor was sending over pages and pages and pages of new filings and new documents. So obviously this Crown prosecutor, it seems to me, I mean, why would you do all that hard work 
if you if the next morning literally you were going to walk into court and abandon the case to stay a prosecution that's the technical term for for saying to the judge your honor the crown prosecutors will not proceed now theoretically they could open it up again in the future but what i'm trying to understand pastor arthur is how the night before the crown prosecutor can be out for blood filing new documents, serving new documents, threatening all sorts of things, and then hours later walk into court and say, oh, no, uh, we're not going to proceed. What on earth was her explanation? Uh, that was um, that was a really not a valid explanation. This was just to frustrate us. This was just to waste our resources. As you know, Sarah spent uh, half a night going through the documents. I was told there was 46 pages, a number of binders. So she had to go through it, prepare. Uh, the Crown um, suggested before maybe we should postpone the trial. Uh, Sarah talked to me. I said, absolutely not. I want to deal. Let's face the music, head-on collision. Whatever happens, I need to deal with all of this craziness. This is two years already. Her official explanation to the judge was that her key witness, and, and what a joke, Ezra, yeah. Yeah. her key yeah. witness that just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, well, he is on a sick leave. Uh, we don't know when he's going to come back. Um, another interesting fact is that he's evidence, which we, of course, provided to them. Uh, we're not hiding. It was a public event. There was hundreds of uh, cameras rolling. They used my own feed from my Facebook and, and YouTube. But miraculously, his uh, body camera and the footage of his, this key, mysterious key witness of the Crown uh, prosecutor's uh, case, while his body camera and the footage disappeared. They don't know how that was possible. They don't know what happened. It's gone. And now this key witness that the whole thing was built upon, in quote, of course, <laughs> it's a joke, yeah. um, yeah. while well, he is very sick. And he is not coming back to work. And we do not know if he will ever come back to work as a police officer. Uh, therefore, the Crown uh, said we are staying the charges. Yeah, it's it's obviously a ruse that's simply not credible. As you pointed out, the there is an enormous amount of, quote, evidence, evidence, I think, of your lawful conduct. Uh, but what, you know, if the Crown thinks your conduct was unlawful, there's countless hours of video footage, like you say, most of it taken by you. If this so-called critical prosecution witness didn't have any video footage of his own, um, the Crown had previously certified that they were ready for trial on this. It's so it's you know this is not a key witness. The the key evidence is your own footage. This is the Crown prosecutor bullying you, putting you through the stress and expense of a lawyer, uh, of a of preparation. Thank God the democracy fund is carrying Sarah Miller's cost, but still the stress on you, the time wasting on you, the stigma of this hanging over you, the risk, however remote, of a $100,000 fine, and the fact that this has been going on for such a long time, this is abusive. I don't know if you know this, Arthur, but I used to practice law way back in the day. And there's two tests for whether or not the Crown prosecutor should proceed against someone. And they're very common sense. The first is... Is it in the public interest? Is this really important for the good of the province that this happened? <laughs> of course, it fails that first test. You know, what you do on the street is peaceful. In many cases, it's charitable. There's no public interest in prosecuting you. And, and like you say, when there's such a shortage of prosecutors uh, to go after real criminals. And the second, is there a reasonable likelihood of conviction? And there simply wasn't. There's, it's so bizarre that they literally settled the morning of the trial. And, and I have to think, why did they put you through this whole thing if they had such a weak case? It's clearly that there's political machinations in the background. The prosecution of you was political to begin with. And maybe there's other politics coming into play now. What do you think? Do you think someone I called her off? Do you think some big boss phoned her up that morning and said, hey, prosecutor, you're thrown in the towel because it's just weird to me that she was filing all these documents the night before, which must have been a lot of work. Like your lawyer, Sarah Miller, had a lot of work to get ready for it. But it was surely more work for the prosecutor to put together this 46 page brief and all the binders like to do that. And then the next morning and you say if she was sulking and she wouldn't even make eye contact or say hello, maybe some boss called her up in the morning and said, call it off. 
that, that that's a possible explanation that she wanted to go at you, but some bigger boss called her off. What do you think? It could be. It's possible. I mean, we have been working in the background from the political, um, you know, on, on the political level, uh, trying to talk to the UCP government to, you know, to take their dogs, to call their uh, dogs off, because this is pure vendetta. Tyler Chandra, as you know, has been embarrassed. Um, for the past uh, few years as the Minister of Health. And now uh, he is the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General. So purely for those people, it's personal. It is vendetta. They were caught in a Sky Palace hypocrisy. When I was rotting in prison, they were partying left and right, caught red-handed. And one law for me, a totally different for the rest of us slaves, I guess, according to them. So I don't know. I don't really know what happened. I am pushing hard. I am trying to tell Albertans what's really going on. Maybe someone smarter than the minister, Chandra, said, hey, this is not in our interest to yeah. wage the war against the ministers and pastors for doing what? Like, Ezra, what did I do? I save lives. Yeah. I save Albertans on a weekly basis for the past 23 years. Yeah. Instead of receiving support from the Alberta government, I constantly receive police presence, bylaws, health inspectors, tickets, trials, arrests. I mean, this must stop. So I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to God and to you and to Sarah that she was willing to proceed, that she spent that night looking through the documents, uh, wasting, obviously wasting the money that were donated uh, for our defense, but, be, because I think they have an agenda. I think mm -hmm. it's personal. It is a vendetta. They wanted to hurt us. They wanted to keep me subdued, if you will. As you know, I am still on house arrest from 7 to 7. I'm waiting my trial uh, uh, at the beginning of February. And they use this trial, this particular ticket during the bail hearing against me. So uh, now while you know, when I'm out and I'm winning, we are winning every single trial right now, every fight with those people. Maybe they realize, hey, um, this is not looking good. I mean, no huh. one is buying this agenda anymore. No one is believing us that this is in the public interest. So hopefully, I pray that those people will just let me live my life in peace. That's what I want. That's what I always wanted, as you remember. I've told them thousands of times. Leave me alone, people. Yeah. Let yeah. me do what I'm good at. I'm good at saving lives. I'm good at giving people hope. Uh, I'm not asking anything from you. I don't want anything from you. Just let me be. Yeah. You know what? We just heard that another Calgary pastor has been charged with giving out food without a license to the hungry. I mean, only in Calgary would they put red tape and bureaucracy again. Like it, there's a real, there's some, there's a real problem. In Alberta, you wouldn't think it. It's the province whose motto is strong and free. And yeah. Calgary, it likes to think of itself as the freest city in the country. It is, they have a strange, crazy blind spot. It's not, it, it's you mainly. They've charged, I know they've given you more than a hundred fines, charges, tickets, court dates, more than a hundred. But it's others too. And we know that they, they of course seized the Grace Life Church up in Edmonton, uh, just south of Edmonton and other churches too. You know what it makes me think of? Um, I don't know if you know this, Pastor Arthur, but after the Second World War was over, for years, like literally years, I think it went all the way into the 1950s, they discovered little clumps of Japanese soldiers who were on some remote island who didn't know the war was over. So it was the late 1940s, early 1950s, and they discovered these soldiers who had just been cut off from the main Japanese army and thought that they were still fighting America. And when they were discovered, they had to be told, no, the war is over and Japan surrendered and you can go home now. Like they were still were living in the 40s in the war. And I think that some parts of the Justice Department in Alberta and a lot of parts of Alberta Health Services are still living like those Japanese soldiers. They're still fighting the war of the 1940s. They don't realize that the war is over. They lost, and now they're on some crazy vendetta, and they need to be deprogrammed and brought back to normal life. And if they're on the justice side, how about go after real criminals now? And if they're on the healthcare side, how about, you know, do some real health care instead of following your crazy vendetta? I think there's something, there's a psychological, these guys are in a rut that it, it really feels like revenge. It really feels personal. And I wonder how many times they have to lose before 
you know, they, they just don't go after you anymore. You're not exaggerating when you say you've won every single time. Now, in one case, you had to go up to the court of appeal where you got a unanimous ruling three to zero to overturn a lower court. But if I'm not mistaken, you have actually won every single matter that has gone to court. So I come back to those tests for a prosecution. Is it in the public interest? Obviously not. Do they have a reasonable likelihood of conviction? Obviously not. And yet they're coming for you again in February. I Something is rotten in the state of Alberta. It is 100%. It's personal. It is a vendetta. Of course, as you know, I'm very vocal. I'm doing my best to warn people about what I think is happening and coming to my beloved Canada. As you know, and you can tell, of course, very quickly, I grew up behind the Iron Curtain under the boots of the Soviets. I've seen this movie before, and we must change the script. We have to push this evil away. Do you know, Ezra, and and I'm sure you remember because you covered my cases before, uh, even before the rebel, that there are laws in the province of Alberta that state that giving free goods and services are prohibited by law, distribution of printed material. So if I give you a Bible or a gospel track on the streets of Calgary or Edmonton or anywhere within the province of Alberta, I'm actually committing a crime. If I give a sandwich to a dying child on the street of Calgary, I am committing a crime. Those are laws in the books. Like, I'm, I, it's shocking when I share that to the normal people, to the public, they don't want to believe me that... They don't want to believe that the government can become so evil that would criminalize someone that actually feeds the poor and saves lives. Derek Reimer is facing $10,000 as we speak right now. $10,000 ticket, he has a salmon, so he doesn't even have an option to just pay it. He he has to go to court. He has to be subjected to this yeah. Punishment, because that's what yeah. it is, Ezra. This is the whole process becomes a punishment. Me yeah. being in metal cages in solitary confinement, they already punished me. Yeah. Uh, Sarah told me that um, that of course I'm facing up to you know ten and a half years combined if they wanted to throw a book at me, but she could not find she could not find any other precedent or case um, ever that a person charged with those offenses would spend more than seven days in prison. So I spent 50 days. On the 51st, I was released, which is Riemann Center. That's almost 80 days in prison. For what? What have I done? I just said to the people, stand up for your rights, but do it peacefully. No guns, no yeah. swords, peacefully. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my speech is fiery. Take it yeah. or leave yeah. it. Yeah. Love it or yeah. hate it. I don't care. Yeah. But it's yeah. lawful. You mentioned Derek Reimer. That is the name of the other pastor. And I'm, I'm pleased to tell our viewers that the Democracy Fund has come to terms uh, with Sarah Miller, uh, because I think who best to defend a pastor in Calgary who is being bullied by the authorities than your lawyer, Sarah, who unfortunately has now had a lot of training and experience in these matters. So I think that, um, like, a, I mean, I... I know you've spent a lot of time working with Sarah, so you've been in court with her and you've seen her in action. I think you'll agree that the government has made a mistake going after Derek Reimer with Sarah on the case. I am quite certain that he'll get the best representation possible. And again, that's courtesy of crowdfunding through the Democracy Fund. Well, this is incredible. I want to ask you, I mean, let's put aside your the the upcoming prosecution of you in in early February, which I think is a disgrace. And I think the province will lose. And I think, frankly, the law may well be struck down as unconstitutional. If it's if they're going to use an eco-terrorism law against you, well, then it deserves to be struck down as unconstitutional. But let me ask you bigger picture. Put aside that that upcoming eco-terrorism. Like, seriously, like, it's just so absurd. They're just throwing everything at you but the kitchen sink. Let me ask you a political question instead of a legal question. Do you think the province of Alberta and do you think the country of Canada cares more about civil liberties now or less? On the one hand, we've allowed ourselves to be abused for years, including by the Emergencies Act martial law. So on the one hand, we let terrible things happen. On the other hand, I think a lot of people did wake up. Um, People who in the past might have called themselves liberal, might have called themselves green or, or socialist or whatever. If they had any 
libertarianism in their blood. I think they woke up. People who used to say, my body, my choice, have woken up. Do you think the state of civil liberties in Canada, in the hearts of people, do you think it's stronger or weaker now than it was three years ago? A hundred percent. If we had this conversation a few years ago, I think majority of people would not even care if I live or die. But right now, wherever I travel, I travel all over. And again, I have to receive a permission from my probation officer to even meet with my constituents uh, and, and the people that uh, potentially are going to vote for us. Um, so I travel around Alberta and there is always hundreds of people showing up and everyone that comes to me says, thank you for standing up. We didn't know how bad it is. So what I would say is that millions of Canadians have been awakened. And if it comes to the government, the government is pushing hard. The government is trying to destroy our liberties. But the people, I believe, are pushing back as well. And they say, hey, wait a second. You're supposed to protect our rights, not to take those rights away from us. So I see more and more people aligning our, uh, themselves with what we were warning them about a few years ago. There is sympathy, but more than that, there is awareness that what we're observing right now is a simple repetition of history. Uh, just like the saying, they came for the Jews, but I didn't say anything because I was not the Jew. Jew. You, you know how it goes. And when finally they went after all of the others that were vocal and they came for them, there was no one else to stand up, to speak. So I think Canadians are realizing if they will not join the fight, if you will, against this tyranny now, they might face what the Jewish people did face in 39, 40, 41. And of course, as a Polish immigrant growing up in a city with a concentration camp, uh, and having my grandparents telling me stories about the Nazis and, and the fascists, what they did to my country, uh, I am fully aware that the tactics that were used by the Nazis are identical to the tactics that are being used right now by this totalitarian regime that is unchecked. There are no checks and balances anymore. There's no accountability. Uh, there is no even a structure of power that would balance some kind of an individual that wants to become a tyrant. So we need to change the system. And how are we going to do it? when we come together, when good people will join forces and say, enough is enough, that's it, we have seen the corruption and we are not agreeing with that corruption. So I think there is a, a big awakening. I've never seen a bigger awakening in this country than right now. Yeah. Well, it's incredible. Uh, I think it has awoken people, but it's also shown us how many Canadians were happy to be compliant in the authoritarianism, and of course you would have seen that firsthand in Poland under Soviet domination, that many people were free, and the Polish people are, are very freedom-oriented people going back centuries, by the way. But there were surely those amongst every population who were happy to be informants, happy to be enforcers, happy to be snitches, and we saw those same human characteristics express themselves in Canada. We all like to think we would have done the right thing in Nazi Germany 80 years ago, but let's get real. A lot of people would have loved the power. They would have loved being on the powerful side. They would have given into conformity and peer pressure. And, and when you spoke out, it was very lonely to do so. And now I think a lot of people have come around to it, but you paid the price. I'm just thrilled that, uh, that the case against you was abandoned. I'm I'm disappointed that they waited till the morning of the trial. It'll be interesting to see what happens in February. And I just want to remind our viewers that the Democracy Fund has covered uh, Arthur Pavlovsky's legal fees, those of his brother David, those of other pastors, including Derek Reimer, who's going back uh, in front of uh, a judge again, other Christian churches, Church in the Vine in northern Alberta, churches in other provinces even. So if this is something that you care about, go to savearthur.com, savearthur.com, and that's a donation to the Democracy Fund. You'll get a charitable tax receipt for it, and it goes 100% to the Democracy Fund. Rebel News does not take any funds from that. It's just kept completely separate in the Democracy Fund charity. And that's actually, Arthur is client number one. Over the last year and a half, the Democracy Fund has taken more than 2,000 cases, none of them as spectacular as Arthur's, none of them as notorious, none of them as abusive. But 
all of them in some way a tragedy for the person targeted. Pastor Arthur, congratulations on your win in court on Friday. Congratulations on maintaining your courage and uh, your inspiration of others. And uh, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we'll talk to you in the new year. And we will be there at your next trial in February because that's going to be an atrocious one. So keep fighting. Thank you so much, Ezra. Merry Christmas to you too, to your listeners, to your viewers. I want to thank you so much for all your support, for every donation. I mean, without your support, I'll probably still be in prison. So be blessed. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And stand strong. Do not give up. Do not be terrified. There is more of us than of them. In the end, we know how the story ends. We win. The enemy just doesn't know it yet. God bless you. Right on. Thanks for that. There you have it. Arthur Pavlovsky. You can go to SaveArthur.com. That's an excerpt from my show every night. It's called The Ezra Levant Show. That's me, Ezra Levant. Uh, you can see the whole thing behind our paywall. Well, there's a lot of goodies behind there. I do a show every weeknight. My friends Sheila Gunn-Reed and David Menzies and Nat and Kat have their shows too. You get a ton of content for just eight bucks a month. There's so much in there you won't find anywhere else. Go to rebelnewsplus.com.